presentations of Japanese and international students. Uh, that will be by uh, Dr. Kingsbury and Mona Smith from Mayville State, uh, North Dakota. So everyone, welcome. Thank you very much. As you may have noticed, we only have two discussion panels, right, for, for this one here. So we're not going to be too sensitive on, on the time there. I'll still give you the five-minute warning just to kind of give you a heads up. Um, and if we could all just keep our questions to the end, we'll have a combined Q&A session at the end. Then. Okay. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, the, the floor is yours. Sure. Yeah. Yep. and I'm at Hosei University. Um, I'm currently a full professor there and I wear many hats. And uh, today we're talking about, well, student mobility. The, the topic is a little bit vague and actually a little bit um, in process right now in terms of what our research is, is and what it's going to be. We'll hope to, hopefully in a year's time we'll have more to actually, uh, in terms of outcomes and conclusions to, to, to show you. But, this is sort of like this, the start of a, a research project with uh, um, me and my partner, Anthony Fenton. So, would you like to? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Throw me in there. Okay, right, yeah. So, trends in Japanese student mobility. Uh, so, whenever we do research or we, go, we do cross-border research, that really goes to comparative education. Comparatively, international education is, is we're in the same field essentially. So <clears throat> we're looking at research in, in higher educational settings, but not necessarily. We're also in, in our case we're looking at there hasn't been any real research done on uh, students, Japanese students going to the Philippines, and that is in, seems to be increasingly a popular uh, point of destination. So when we look at comparative education or comparative studies, what we're doing is we're looking, we call it comparative perspective taking. And to do that, we have to expand, the purpose of that is to expand our understanding beyond uh, our own localized perspective. And comparative education isn't a discipline, it's a field of study. Now, it borrows from a number of other disciplines. It involves cross-cultural investigation requires sense making or what we call meaning making of the new or the unknown by comparing to one's own frame of reference from, from where you are, from your perspective. It also allows for multiple interpretation of issues or problems or uh, challenges that, that we face that are cross-border in nature. Uh, it helps us avoid dichotomous thinking and sometimes that happens here when foreigners sort of locate to a new country and they stay there and they begin to see things <coughs> their perspective. It helps us broaden our conceptual lenses and develop the critical thinking skills that a global citizen is kind of expected to have. It requires systematic critique and reflection must accompany curiosity. This here model is a geometric model of student persistence and achievement, and since that is the focus, we'll focus on students in this particular case. We're always interested to know what kind of what kind of experience that they have, you know. And there are three sides of this model, obviously. There's the cognitive factors, there's social factors, and, and institutional factors that come into play. <coughs> on the side of cognitive factors, we're really interested in from a quality assurance perspective, and that's really where I'm coming from. Uh, you're more to the mobility side, but academic rigor, what kind of learning, what, what is the quality or, of the nature of the learning, or uh, learning outcomes, uh, aptitude, what is the content knowledge, uh, critical thinking uh, ability, the technology ability that they have with that, study skills, learning skills, time management skills, so really academic skills, academic related extracurricular activities. What are those activities? How are they supported? Where are the risks involved? That kind of thing. 
to the other side, to social factors, we're dealing with financial issues. So our finance is a key reason for why they're choosing the point of destination. And that's what we're kind of interested in. It's why are they choosing that destination? How is it being marketed to, to them? Educational legacy, the attitudes towards learning. It also may involve religious background, the maturity of, of the participants, social coping skills, communication skills, attitudes toward others, cultural values, the expectations that they have, uh, goal commitment, family influence, peer influence, and social lifestyle. And all of these, in terms of the institutional factors, involve financial aid, student services. These things need to be investigated, recruitment and admission strategies, as well as academic services and curriculum and instruction and pedagogy. The impact of agents on, so if we focus on, really, we're, we're looking at three parts of the puzzle here. One are the agents. And there's a recent study that came out a couple of days ago that looked at students that were destined for the US. And this comes from WNR. And in this case, you can see that there, this study had to do with the influence. So influence, my decision to enroll in an institution, increase the likelihood, likeliness for me to, uh, to get enrolled in an US <coughs> institution, and the significance of significant factors that, uh, that set them up for success at their destination institution. That's what that study. Raised. And the essence of that study reports that overall there's a significant majority of respondents across the globe. So this was a global study uh, for students that are destined to the US. 85% indicated that they felt that compensation was essentially fair that they paid to their agents. Uh, they paid their agents for the services they used, which is all part of the market driven strategy that a lot of institutions have embraced. Also that 83% of the students were either satisfied or very satisfied with the agent services supporting this finding. Now to the quality assurance side, which is what we're really interested in. With quality assurance, this is a typology which I devised for some other research I was working on. It comes from Harvey and Green, uh, 1993, and Jane Knight. 2001, and essentially when we look at quality assurance, we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six different categories of quality, and namely quality of excellence as excellence, so what is quality? Quality is excellence, so a traditional, under this, this particular type or category of quality involves a traditional understanding of the best jobs possible that, that students can get after they graduate. Uh, it's frequently identified with higher education. The manufacturing sector embraces a, what we call a quality of zero errors, a drive for perfection, a zero errors approach. Uh, quality is in terms of transformation. And that involves developmental and evolutionary form basis of uh, quality and faculty and student development and empowerment. So that goes inside of organizational studies. And then there's quality as threshold. Quality of threshold is really a set of externally imposed standards, such as those imposed by MECs, norms or criteria, perceived as objective and consistent. So that's, that's the perception. So uh, they're contextual, are they contextually appropriate? When I say that, I mean, are they institutionally or, or you know, university contextually appropriate? set out a standardized set of standards. Are they static or steady state once a quality threshold is achieved? So the notion of standards is often used in certification or accreditation of programs. Then there's quality in terms of enhancement, so continuous improvement, ongoing qualities. So that's the mere image of threshold approach. It involves dynamic measures or interventions or initiatives that are non-caustic. Non-caustic being they're not static, they're, they're ongoing. So challenging, uh, the challenge is to obtain an objective measure with all of that. And should it be a fixed measure or really is it something that is a 
adaptable as we, as, as we, as our institutions develop. Then there's quality as fitness for purpose. And this is difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, to get your head around or define. Quality in general. Quality needs to be seen as an appropriateness for specific purpose for institutional context. It has to be well articulated with a clear vision and a strategic mission. And I should comment that one study that was done, I don't know if you were involved in that or not. It was Yoni Zawa, I think it was. But it, but it showed that a few years ago, about, about 10 years ago, when internationalization was really moving forward, that a lot of uh, university presidents didn't have a vision here. That was over 70% didn't have a, a clear vision. That's changed over and over now. The strategic objectives with accessible outcomes are that are both qualitative and quantitative in terms of assessment. So that, that this here point here really is key for the universities. Now when we marry up internationalization and quality assurance, we're really looking at two things, one, two sections. One, domains and attributes or characteristics or features or descriptors. Uh, and with these, this is my work, but knowledge dimensions, validation, recognition, domestic and international structural variation, as well as governance and policy. <coughs> so to the side of knowledge dimensions, when we talk about quality assurance, we're really talking about features or characteristics that refer to research and scholarly collaboration, rules of knowledge transfer, modes of knowledge uh, transfer. In our particular research proposal that we are in the throes of putting together, Really, it's border crossing dialogue, academic programs, and extracurricular activities that apply to this, and that we will want to design an instrument that has, uh, you know, an instrument that is has descriptors on it that will measure that. Validation recognition is another. So when we, when we do the field research, we go to the visiting desk. Uh, the, destination we'll want to look at what is the curriculum what about pedagogical practice uh, methodology what kinds of assessment measures do they have in place uh, the faculty themselves their credentials the reputation of the organization as well as their linkages their affiliations and more and more that's becoming an issue in terms of legal liability then there's domestic and international structural variation Again, the ones that I hear most apply to our, uh, our interests are admissions and viability, the programs, funding modes, uh, human resources, operations, and services. Human resources in terms of what's available to, uh, to the students and, and support that, that is there. Faculty structures are there, but it's not really a concern for the purpose of, of this research project. Then there's governance and policy, the other uh, key domain, and that has to do with administration management and cooperative engagement. You're up. <laughs> okay. Um, again, uh, I, I'm at Boston University. I've been there for 10 years almost. And, uh, well, not quite eight years, I guess. Uh, I wear many hats. I'm currently the, uh, uh, the director of the International Student Program, a short-term exchange program, essentially, and most of my background has been on the education and support of international students in Japan. Uh, and just, just, just to give a little more impetus to why we're, we're researching what we're doing and sort of the breadth of our background and how hopefully we can collaborate well together, we're still, still at the uh, beginning stages of that. Um, is when I started teaching Japanese students, uh, I became really concerned about their international education, not only their language education, but you know what they were, what they were learning there, and, and their op that includes their opportunities for study abroad. And within the whole uh, picture of international education in Japan, I think over the last two or three decades. Um, Three, two or three decades, the focus, at least on a national level, has been on bringing more international students into the country, and it's been it's neglected uh, sending Japanese students over. Now, now the pendulum is swinging a little bit to the opposite end with the recent 
uh, global Jinzai budget, but you know, you know, national university budgets come to an end, and then the, so uh, it's hard to really think of international education in Japan as really a sustainable process. But this is sort of um, what's been happening. And ever since 2004, there's a peak in, in Japanese international students, or Japanese students going overseas. This is all outbound. And then we had another uh, upkick, up, uptick in 2012, but then it declined again. So obviously the, the, the programs or the, the funding that the government is putting into place is not sufficient really to sustain um, international uh, Japanese students uh, going overseas. Um, however, they, you know, the, the government makes pronouncements and by 2020, by the Olympics, they want to double the number of Japanese. And I think uh, Kuomura Sensei is talking about 120,000, um, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, the decline uh, recently again. Um, and then we have the new government programs, which, which uh, I, I'd like to find out more about. There, I don't think there's been these programs like Tobitate. Uh, they're, they're very new, there's not a lot of data on them. Um, however, uh, in just recent data from UNESCO and the Japanese Association of Overseas Students, which is a consortium of Japanese language or English, uh, English language school, or uh, agencies basically, um, they paint a different story of the total number of Japanese students going overseas. Some obstacles we've talked about in, in over the over the years, uh, the media and uh, powers that be have tended to think of Japanese as being <coughs> insular, uchimuki, and I, I've, I've, in my experience, um, that is not necessarily the case. Although there's a lot of data that uh, speak to that particular uh, theory, but what I what I found really though for Japanese going overseas, the the main obstacles tend to be financial. Um, linguists, they, they, they lack the, the funds uh, to go overseas because it's all, oftentimes to an English speaking country it's, it's quite, quite expensive. Linguistic, they don't have the necessary uh, English language skills to, to go overseas. Academic, often they have during their first or second year, they didn't apply themselves. And in the university setting, um, the, the chance or the opportunity to to go overseas is often based on how high, high your GPA is, but a lot of students they goof off the, for the first, first, first or second year, and that basically destroys their chance from go, from go, going in a university uh, capacity overseas. And then the systemic uh, obstacles, which we've heard about, including job hunting issues, and then the actually the um, the academic calendar of Japanese uh, schools. And I think recently that there's been some changes in, in including, including the, in the um, adoption of quarter, quarter systems at some of the universities, which may uh, help, help with all of that. But still, you've got some, quite a few obstacles to um, increasing the number of Japanese students to go overseas. Um, anyway, this is, this is, the, this is the information that the JAOS, the consortium of, I think, 36 different um, uh, agencies, study abroad agencies, have come up with. And uh, so they, they, have, they have an estimation of 170,000, which is a lot more, obviously, than what the government is reporting. And um, I took this into our office yesterday and asked um, the the people in my you know, global education center about this. I think there's some there's some overlap, so this might actually be a um, an overestimation because of just some overlap. So basically, we're talking the students going overseas through university programs. Well, this is the one. This is the one that Moka Show Ministry of Education has determined, and then you have other students who are going who are university students, yet they are um, they're going to non uh, universities that do not have agreements or a, like a, a certified or a, a legitimate agreement between universities. So there's I think you find what we find is the diversification of Japanese students going overseas. 
I mean, this includes, this is also, um, includes non-university students as well. Where I think, for the most part, we're fo probably focusing on university students who choose to use agents um, to go overseas. Um, so that's the data from uh, JOS, J-O-S. And so, um, what is interesting though, um, it, you, uh, basically, apart from the, the Ministry of Education data that we have, so we find uh, almost 65,000 um, additional Japanese students going overseas, many in the high school, junior, uh, junior high school, and then, then the large number of students who are now going to the Philippines every year. So, so I guess the number that we talk about, I think that agrees with the uh, number 120,000 of actual students, which is about double, over double what MEX was reporting. So. Um, what I see is there's a lot of been growth, not a lot of growth at the super global unit funded universities as well for the short term essay. Um, more different kinds of programs and more students are participating kind of for their first first going overseas. The language training programs and in my in the case of my university, we send actual actually quite a few more students to to Malaysia and um, then we do to the Philippines and there's one faculty in my um, university that is sending students to the Philippines. However, it's not an official sanctioned, uh, it's not actually sanctioned by the university. So there's, it's kind of going through um, a different route. Um, and so but most still go through partnership universities, which my university, we happen to have over 200 now. Um, partnerships. So I think that will probably be increasing in the near future as well um, because I think there's about 2,000 Philippine universities now. Uh, potentially it could be good study abroad settings for Japanese students. And this, many students study outside of this jurisdiction. So these are the numbers of students who are studying at non-agreement based universities which has increased over the years as well. Many of them. So are still going to North America, although I think the numbers going to Canada probably are <laughs> growing, while well, the num numbers going to the United States are probably on the decline for various reasons I won't get into. Um, and well, and then you have well, the more going to much more going to Asia, that's going to probably increase. And this is these are the data from 2015, I think. So, and lastly, so this is um, again we're still at the. Uh, infancy, infancy of, of our of our actual data collection and what exactly we're going to be going to be doing. But these are the numbers of Philippine language schools, and obviously we can see a huge increase. And um, historically, over well, the last few years, uh, Korean students have been the pioneers to go to these language schools. But I think um, it's been proven to be a viable study abroad opportunity for many students. And uh, so, but we plan to. Um, they have to analyze, uh, look at the student data, um, issues of satisfaction, and then do the quality assurance thing with the, both the agencies and also the, the, uh, the schools um, doing field, field work in the Philippines, hopefully. So, um, the, important, the important thing, I, you know, there was a presentation earlier that I was part of that, that group, and you know, I kind of held my feet. And that was on in, in mobility. Of, we're, we're looking at students that are out, going over. But the important thing is to look at these in terms of is not is this a success or a failure, but what is the experience and to try to define that experience and to try to do more of a meta study so that we don't just lock ourselves into looking at just one, one set, but we're looking at well, where are the students going to? Are they going to language schools? Uh, universities and to try to get them out of assessment. I think we need to do both actually. We need to look at the mm -hmm. language schools and, and the universities are hosting students. So that would be the connection, especially because we're kind of That's right. higher education. So. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's it. So I think that's all. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time tonight, Dr. Um As I said before, we're going to hold the Q&A off until the end and do a combined session. Um, sure. We've got a couple of minutes to get set up uh, and we'll go